Hello, and welcome to A Reader's History of Science Fiction. I'm Alex Howe, and this is episode 36, Alternate History. This is a follow-up to the previous two episodes, which were all about time travel. And this makes sense, because alternate history is really adjacent to time travel, and you'll find a lot of overlap between the two. Most alternate history proper doesn't include time travel, but any time travel stories where people change Earth's past will be at least a little bit alternate history. Alternate history, of course, consists of stories that take place in worlds like our own, but where historical events unfolded differently. The most famous example is probably Philip K. Dick's The Man in the High Castle, about a world where the Axis powers won World War II and divided North America between them. World War II and the American Civil War seem to be very popular topics for this genre, which honestly may reflect more on the authors themselves than on actual history. Alternate history is also distinctive in that it seems to be especially popular on the internet. Maybe it's because it's technically a form of real people fan fiction, or maybe because it feeds into the internet pastime of historical and political debates. Regardless, alternate history has a long, well, history online, going all the way back to the Usenet groups of the 80s and 90s, when it was just starting to become popular in the mainstream press. And more than that, Some of the big published names were active in those groups going back to the beginning. I think it's for this reason that the genre has its own jargon, separate from the rest of speculative fiction, which grew out of this online community. It's so prevalent that you really need to understand it to discuss the genre properly. And I think it's worth looking into because it really gives a feel for how the genre operates and the different directions it can go. Often, alternate histories will begin with a single changed event. For example, Lincoln not being shot at Ford's Theater is a popular one. Sometimes the initial change is even smaller than that. Something of the for want of a nail variety. But even with the tiniest change, the author can rely on the butterfly effect to let the timelines diverge as far as they like from there. In fact, they'll even use butterflied away as a verb when describing outcomes that have been averted. This single change is called the point of divergence, or POD and many good stories can be told this way, although it's not universal. Other times, including in The Man in the High Castle, the divergence is more nebulous. Meanwhile, some alternate histories involve very large and exotic changes. Perhaps it will even be a very different world, such as one with magic, but still having the same historical people. In that case, we say butterflies are not in play. A term you'll see thrown around for these wild changes is Alien Space Bats, or ASB. In a literal sense, this is a case where the point of divergence is some kind of alien intervention. However, it can also mean, and in fact originally meant, a point of divergence so wild and implausible that it must have been done by aliens, even though the author insists it's natural. It was originally coined by Usenet member Allison Brooks in, what else, a discussion about World War II. Brooks stated that the Nazis' Operation Sea Lion, Hitler's planned invasion of Britain, was so unlikely to succeed that it could only have worked with the help of alien space bats. Today, the term is used at least as much in cases of literal aliens, or at least some kind of outside intervention. In Harry Turtledove's World War series, the alien space bats, or lizards actually, are a literal alien invasion happening during World War II. Meanwhile, in his The Guns of the South, the alien space bats are human time travelers giving the Confederacy automatic weapons. The ISOT, which I mentioned in the last episode, where a group of people or even an entire country is mysteriously transported back in time, also falls under alien space bats. An alternate term for ASB in cases like that is the ROB, or Random Omnipotent Being where it's even clearer that the intervention is some capricious supernatural event and is deliberately not even sci-fi levels of plausible. If alien space bats seem to be sticking around after the point of divergence, pushing the timeline in a particular group's favor, you may be encountering, and I promise this is the real term, a wank. Sorry, I didn't make it up. A wank is a timeline where some person or country seems to be born lucky and makes impossible advances in technology and or military prowess. Probably the most infamous example is S.M. Sterling's Domination of Draca series, 
in which our world South Africa is replaced with the British colony of Drakia, later Draca, which is flooded by royalists, confederates, and other all-around racists and proto-fascists throughout the 19th century, while at the same time making impossible leaps in technology and military power despite running a southern-style plantation system. By the then-present of the 1990s, Draca has conquered the world with a brutal totalitarian dictatorship, which de facto makes the whole thing a South Africa wank, even though it's a highly fictionalized version of South Africa. Sterling insists that he wasn't going for realism, though, nor that he was taking a proto-fascist stand. The premise, as he describes it, is, quote, Suppose everything had turned out as badly as possible these last few centuries. Unquote. I should probably mention that many people dispute Sterling's stated political position in some respects. He was actually banned from AlternateHistory.com a few years ago for Islamophobic comments, some of which dated back to before 9-11. Anyway, other acronyms you should definitely know in the community are OTL, for Our Timeline or Original Timeline, and ATL or TTL, for Alternate Timeline or This Timeline, respectively. You'll see these a lot in discussions about stories, pinning down how the alternate history is different from ours and how plausible it is. Another less frequent term is the double-blind what-if, or DBWI, which is a recursive alternate history, writing our world from the point of view of someone in the alternate timeline. These are often included as Easter eggs in regular alternate history stories, most notably with The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, the fictitious book in The Man in the High Castle about a world where the Allies won the war. That's the modern side of alternate history. As you can imagine, it also has a historical legacy, although it's a surprisingly thin one in the mainstream press. Maybe that's another reason why it feels a little bit like a sort of underground movement from the 80s and 90s. You can find speculation about what might have happened if events had gone differently all the way back to antiquity. However, fictional depictions appear to begin in the Renaissance and later, often stemming from romantic notions of what might have been, such as Joanot Martorell's Tyrant le Blanche from 1490, which described Constantinople repelling the Ottoman invasion, or Louis Joffrey's 1836 novel Napoleon and the Conquest of the World, which is exactly what it sounds like. H.G. Wells dipped his toe in the genre with his 1905 book A Modern Utopia, in which the protagonist is transported to a world where, for reasons that are never really described, the world has developed into a utopian society. Although, this book was less a proper novel and more a thinly veiled sociological treatise. However, Wells did establish the then new idea of being transported to the corresponding geographic location in the other world in this book. Speculative articles about alternate history continued to be published in the pulp era, some fiction and some nonfiction. However, it stayed pretty low-key for most of the 20th century, appearing more as a consequence of time travel than anything else, with only occasional breakout stories of alternate history proper, like The Man in the High Castle in 1962. Harry Harrison and Michael Moorcock got into it, but even with them involved, it stayed pretty quiet for a long time. The genre finally began to grow in popularity in the 80s, with the rise of steampunk, along with the general growth in interest in the concept. Sterling's Domination series began in 1988, for example. But it really came into its own in the 90s. And a large part of that came about because of one man, Harry Turtledove, the master of alternate history. I mean, Turtledove certainly wasn't the only one to make it big with alternate history. And if you're looking for a single breakout story for the genre as a whole, I might actually go back to Alan Moore's Watchmen from 1986, but Turtledove certainly has written a lot of it. Harry Turtledove began his career as a historian, earning a PhD in early Byzantine history from UCLA in 1977. He published his first novels, Where Blood and Where Night, just two years later, although those were not alternate history. They were fantasy novels featuring werewolves and loosely based on the fall of the Roman Empire. In fact, he's written quite a lot of fantasy in parallel with his alternate history career, even though he's mostly known for the latter. He spent most of his early career writing short stories and a few books under various pseudonyms, 
mainly because his editor thought people wouldn't believe that Turtle Dove was a real name. He finally switched to his real name in the late 80s. And before I get into his alternate history, I should mention one of his earlier works that is especially notable, his short story The Road's Not Taken from 1985. This is not literally alternate history, but it's definitely in the spirit of the genre. In The Road Not Taken, Earth is invaded by aliens in the year 2039. Except the aliens turn out to be old-school conquistadors who fight with matchlock muskets and bayonets. It turns out that faster-than-light travel and anti-gravity are so easy to invent that most species figure them out before they come up with gunpowder while we humans just somehow missed them. I like to think magnets are involved somehow. The trouble is that since they discover them before the Enlightenment and modern science, all the aliens stop developing technologically to go off conquering instead. When 21st century humans with automatic weapons get their hands on the technology, the galaxy is in trouble. Now, Turtle Dove's first alternate history novel, still leaning heavily on fantasy, was the Videsos Cycle from 1987, in which one of Julius Caesar's Roman legions is transported into the future of the Byzantine Empire, except with magic. However, his first big hit was probably his 1992 novel, The Guns of the South. The Guns of the South is technically time travel rather than alternate history, but I regard it as subtly different from, say, Sterling's Island in the Sea of Time. This is because in The Guns of the South, all of the viewpoint characters are what are frequently called downtimers in the genre, natives of the past rather than the uptimer time travelers themselves. Note that these terms are sometimes reversed, but they usually go in that order. The time travelers in question are white supremacists from South Africa, who decide to go back in time to 1864 to help the Confederacy win the Civil War. Remember that Turtle Dove wrote the book right when apartheid was ending in South Africa. They make contact with General Lee and give him literal trainloads of AK-47s and ammunition. Once the Army of Northern Virginia is trained to use them, they're able to repel General Grant's forces and march straight into Washington in a matter of weeks. In fact, it's so easy that it only takes a third of the book. The real trouble starts afterwards, as Robert E. Lee no lover of slavery himself, and seeing the writing on the wall in the form of condemnation from Europe, turns abolitionist and begins pushing the Confederacy to get rid of slavery on its own terms. The South Africans, who have already shown themselves to behave like a parody of southern plantation owners, do not like this and begin to turn against Lee. Turtle Dove also tells the story of two rank-and-file soldiers and how these momentous events impact their lives, Nate Caudell and his paramour Molly Bean a real-life woman who fought for the Confederacy whilst disguised as a man. Personally, I thought this was a very good book, but that's with the caveat that the subject matter is very fraught today. First off, content warning, this is a Civil War drama. You will encounter racial slurs. A lot. And in multiple languages at that. The story is still anti-slavery, as evidenced by Lee's post-war career. But beyond that, it might not hold up as well today as it did 30 years ago. If you're prepared for that, I think it's definitely worth the read. Now, like I said, the Civil War is one of the most popular targets for alternate history, and Turtle Dove was certainly not the first to have this idea. In 1983, Harry Harrison wrote a book with a similar premise, A Rebel in Time, although that one was of the more conventional stop the bad guy from changing history type. Turtle Dove's signature, though, is that he's come up with so many other alternate histories since then. He followed up The Guns of the South with the World War series, in which aliens invade during World War II, forcing the Allies and the Axis to work together to stop them. Next came what is probably his best-known work, the Southern Victory series, also known as Timeline 191, where the South wins the Civil War fair and square, and then things get worse. There's Days of Infamy, where Japan occupies Hawaii during World War II. Then there's the Atlantis series, in which what is the east coast of North America in our world is a separate landmass sitting in the middle of the Atlantic. One of several stories based on alternate prehistory 
where Turtle Dove changes the very shape of the Earth. He also did The War That Came Early, where World War II begins in 1938 due to the dispute over Czechoslovakia. I told you World War II is the other popular target for alternate histories. And his most recent series is The Hot War, where World War III begins in the 1950s after the Korean War goes nuclear. And keep in mind, I'm only talking about his alternate history series here. There are other standalone books and fantasy series. Honestly, the number of books the man has put out is up there in Asimov territory. But Harry Turtledove, of course, is not the whole genre. And there are many other directions it can go. Some alternate history goes further afield, changing not just historical events, but even the laws of nature, reaching into outright fantasy, much like Videsos. One famous example is Naomi Novik's Temeraire series about the Napoleonic Wars in an alternate world where dragons exist. Another development around this time, steampunk stories are by necessity alternate histories, but there I feel like the alternate history is more of a vehicle for them. The point of steampunk isn't as much to explore the history as it is to tell some interesting story with a cool aesthetic that doesn't work in the present or the future. Especially notable here, in my opinion, is William Gibson's and Bruce Sterling's The Difference Engine, which we'll come back to in a couple episodes. Also in the 90s came the television show Sliders, which featured characters traveling to different parallel universes each episode. Some of them were fantasy worlds with magic or other different laws of nature, but some were indeed alternate histories. More of the Doctor Who of alternate history, you might say. Or maybe you wouldn't say that, I haven't actually seen the show. However, there are three recent books that continue to put alternate history on the proverbial map outside of Turtle Dove's sphere of influence. First is The Years of Rice and Salt by Kim Stanley Robinson, better known for Red Mars and 2312. The divergence in The Years of Rice and Salt is a large but simple one. In this world, the Black Death killed 99% of the people in Europe instead of only half as in our world leaving Asia as the uncontested center of world power, mainly China and the various Islamic nations. Robinson follows the history of this world for the ensuing seven centuries to the present day. The next book on the list is The Yiddish Policeman's Union by Michael Shabon. As far as I can tell, The Yiddish Policeman's Union is the first alternate history novel to win both the Hugo and the Nebula Awards. Granted, the nebula hadn't been established yet when The Man in the High Castle came out. And in fact, even other novels that won one of them were peripheral cases involving things like historical fantasy or parallel universes. Just looking at the lists, Shabon's book looks like a real hallmark of the growth of alternate history as a genre. In the world of the Yiddish Policeman's Union, in 1941, a special district was set up in the Alaska Panhandle as a safe haven for Jewish refugees during World War II. A plan that was floated in real life, but was shot down by FDR. Millions of Jews flocked to the Yiddish-speaking Sitka district during the war alone, and millions more came after a consequently weaker state of Israel was destroyed in the First Arab-Israeli War. But, under the political pressure of the 1940s, its residents are not citizens. And the Sitka district was established with a sunset of 2008, after which it would revert to the control of what is now the state of Alaska. And when 2008 rolls around, a Christian Zionist president has vowed to go through with the reversion and send some of Sitka's 4 million strong Jewish population to re-establish Israel. Amidst this backdrop, on the eve of the reversion, Detective Meyer Lonsman tasks himself with investigating the murder of his next-door neighbor, even as the government would prefer to just sweep any trouble under the rug and he soon finds himself falling down a rabbit hole of organized crime and Zionist conspiracies. It's not the best in my opinion, but it's certainly an interesting story. However, I should note that Shabon, though Jewish himself, has been criticized for his portrayal of Jews in the book, so your mileage may vary. Finally, we have the second alternate history book to win both the Hugo and the Nebula, Mary Robinette Kowal's The Calculating Stars. This is one of the most recent books on my reading list, and it's been a pretty big deal since it started making the rounds a couple years ago. 
In The Calculating Stars, a meteor hits the east coast of the United States and wipes Washington, D.C. off the map in 1952. This isn't actually the point of divergence, though. The first point of divergence is that Thomas Dewey wins the 1948 election and facilitates an earlier start to the space program, so that the devastated country has something to build on. After the meteor hits, Elma York, a mathematician and former WASP pilot from World War II, calculates that the aftereffects of the impact will cause catastrophic global warming, leading to a runaway greenhouse effect that will render Earth uninhabitable within a few generations. This necessitates not only a much more aggressive space program, but one that actively involves women to work toward colonizing other planets and saving the human race. This is a story about how the space program might have developed if it had really gone all out, even before computers. Or rather, when computers were still humans, usually women. In that sense, it's a strong what-might-have-been story. But in another sense, all of that is merely the backdrop. The Calculating Stars and its sequels are deeply rooted in the culture of NASA and the United States in the 50s and 60s. And the story is really about Elma and the struggles she faces as a woman with a career, a Jew, and a person living with mental illness in a world where all three of those things represent significant obstacles. It also deals very frankly with race in a way that is sometimes uncomfortable, with Elma as a white woman who earnestly wants to help, but also wants very much to justify herself and frequently screws up badly as a result. There's a lot there, and it's very well done. However, I do have to admit that I have one large problem with it, which is the premise of the runaway greenhouse threat. This plotline puzzled me, especially for such a well-researched story. In theory, it's based on real science, but I was pretty sure from the start that the math didn't work out. I investigated it further and determined that, thankfully for us, the runaway greenhouse does not work. The real problem here seems to be that The Calculating Stars was actually a prequel to Kowal's earlier novella, The Lady Astronaut of Mars, in which she describes Earth still being shrouded with dust, unable to see the stars, decades after the meteor. This was retconned in the books to a permanent water vapor haze over the world. That forced some narrative elements that stretch past the limits of scientific plausibility, and might have been better done some other way. On the other hand, I can cut the characters some slack because it was the 1950s, and climate science was much less developed then. After all, we didn't even know about the greenhouse effect on Venus yet. And they do say that the threat is not a certain one. I've written a companion blog post explaining the science in more detail. Despite this error, I think the rest of the story carries itself very well, and that's why I've decided to make The Calculating Stars my book recommendation for this episode. As big as Turtle Dove is, I think the Lady Astronaut series is really the alternate history we need in the 21st century. This has been A Reader's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is available on Libsyn, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Apple, at least I'm pretty sure it's all of those, and probably a couple others. You can find this podcast and other videos on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction. Thanks to all my new subscribers there. I don't know where you all came from, but going from 200 to 5,000 this fast is pretty wild. I just put up part two of my series on negative mass last week, so go check it out. I'm also on Twitter at Psy Meets Fiction, and you can find all of my writings, including the companion post to this episode, at sciencemeetsfiction.com. In the next episode, we turn to the most quintessentially 80s science fiction in existence. It's time for cyberpunk. Thanks for listening.